We're going to be Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. This is the word of the Lord. Pray one more time with me. Father, thank you for today, Lord. This is the the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it, as the psalmist says. And Lord, we rejoice and are glad in it because you give us the answer to that question. Who do people say that I am, and who do we say that you are? We know that you are the Christ. And Lord, it's in that which we live and move and have our being. We get hope, we get joy, we get peace, and we get grace from understanding and answering that question correctly. So Lord, thank you for showing us yourself through the living word, Jesus Christ. God who came down from heaven, became man and dwelt among us and lived the perfect life in our place and died on the cross for our sin and rose again to defeat sin, death, and hell. And it's in that we rejoice. And so Lord, I pray if there's anyone in here that has not answered that question, that today would be the question that they would answer correctly who you are, not only in their minds, but also in their hearts and transform their lives from here on out through eternity. And for those of us that have, Lord, that, Lord, let this not be something that we already know, and um, Lord, that, but that the, the shocking statement of Peter impact us just as much as it did the first time we came and felt the grace of God change our hearts to answer that call correctly. So, Lord, if... Anyone in here is blind, give us eyes to see. If anyone in here is deaf, give us ears to hear. If anyone in here is weak, give us your strength. And if anyone lacks understanding, give us wisdom this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, go ahead and be seated. Announcements were a little bit longer than usual, but those were some good announcements. I love to see uh, people rally around the gospel in our culture, in our society, where we live work and play. I also, as we were singing, we were talking about the rugged cross, I was just looking up at this background that we have, and I got to say, we got probably one of the best backgrounds in any of the churches in northern Colorado. I mean, the stained glass that, that describes the beauty, the ruggedness of the cross that we get to experience with God's sunlight coming through. I mean, it's just, just an amazing thing. So not only do we understand and can see and can worship God through words of song, but also through works of art. Amen. Mark chapter 8. Jesus, as we know, was the master evangelist. And one of his best tactics in that was asking questions. If you trace this throughout the gospel, we see in Matthew's gospel, Jesus asked 94 questions when talking and engaging people about himself. In the gospel of Luke, he asked 82. In the gospel of John, he asked 49. And in the gospel of Mark, which we are today, he had asked 59 questions to individuals. To, to say, hey, who do you think I am? To help people think clearly on who Jesus was. And as we already read this morning, as you guys know, we're going to look at two of those 59 questions in the Gospel of Mark. And they're good questions. They're great questions. Not only were they great questions for the disciples some 2,000 years ago, but they're very relevant and great questions for us this morning. Therefore, as you and I walk out these doors, that um, we will know where we stand with Jesus when we do that. And hopefully as we walk out those doors, we'll head down to Roland Moore Park for some great fellowship and a little bit of volleyball, as Daniel already mentioned, to enjoy the goodness of God in the, in the face of Christ. So question one. Question one is this. Who does the world say that I am? Who does the world say that I am? Verses 27 and 28. Now, quick context. We, we usually, uh, we taught through the book of Mark. It was our very first book we taught through when we planted the crossing, some, like Daniel said, nine years ago. So a little refresher of where we are in the book of Mark. We're right in the center and the turning point of the gospel of Mark. Jesus has been ministering mainly up in, in the northern uh, region of, of Galilee, up in that area. He's dropped down to Jerusalem a couple times, but now his ministry is about to change, and he's about to set his face towards Jerusalem. 
And what he does is he's telling the disciples in, in, in Mark 9, 10, 11, the reason why he came, the reason why he set his face, the, re, the, the reason why they've been doing all that they've been doing the last three and a half years, the last three years of their lives in following Jesus. Jesus will share with his disciples ultimately why he came. And it was not to cast out demons or to, to heal sick people uh, and physical ailments. It was not necessarily even to preach. The reason why Jesus came was to die on the cross. Sums it up at the pinnacle in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, to give his life as a ransom for many. That's why Jesus came. In Mark 9, 10, and 11, he highlights his death and his resurrection. So this is where we are. This is the hinge. And this is where we see where we are in Mark 8, 27, where Jesus asked these questions. And it says, And when Jesus went up with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others said, Elijah. And others said, One of the prophets. We have parallel accounts in, in Matthew chapter 16, also Luke chapter 9. And so before really heading down to Jerusalem, he first takes them even more north. He goes, he goes 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi, which is a beautiful city, an incredible city. Um, but it's a pagan place. It's a place where Yahweh is not centrally worshipped, but other deities are. In the past, it was a center of Baal worship. Um, and then it, went, it transferred to the Greek god Pan, the, the goat man. Think like Mr. Timnus, right, from the Chronicles of Narnica. That was the, the central figure in which they, they worshipped then. And then now, around Jesus' time, is the, the time of worship dedicated to the cult of Augustus Caesar. In fact, they've done excavation give, uh, digs in Caesarea Philippi where they find minted coins uh, just with this fact of about a Caesar, meant to depict his temple built to honor Caesar. They've, they found caves that were dedicated to this god Pan, and inside these caves they had little markings and writings uh, uh, dedicated to this god Pan. And this is what I love about the Bible. The Bible in general. We're going we're gonna to start next week in, the, in, in Genesis and go through the book of Genesis. And one thing I love about the Bible is when it talks about these cities, when it talks about these places, when it, when it talks about archaeology, it always provens to be true, never in contradiction. And so that's just a beautiful side note as we see why they're up in Caesarea. The reason why they are up there is because this is the context in which Jesus is going to leave his disciples for the rest of the time, that they are going to be ministering to people that do not believe in him. They're going to be ministering to people who believe in other deities. And what separates Christ from them? This is really like a little preseason game for them right now, taking them up north to come in contact with some of these thoughts. So it's in this secular setting, in this pagan setting, where Jesus asked the question, who do people say that I am? Another way to ask it is, what, what is the talk of the town about me? What is culture saying? What are the college professors saying about me? What is Fox News and, and CNN saying about me? Is it fake news or is it legit, right? What are they saying about me? What are, what are the tabloids saying about me? This is the question that Jesus asked. What is the culture around them saying about Jesus? And one of the disciples, we're not sure who, it doesn't say, but we'll say Matthew. He says, well, John the Baptist People, people around us are, are saying, John, you're, you're like John the Baptist. Um, and, and that's a good, solid answer, right? Because who was John the Baptist? John the Baptist was someone who preached the gospel. He preached repentance, right? Uh, he was a guy that uh, bucked authority, whether it was political or religious. Uh, he called hypocrites hypocrites. And we see Jesus line up with that. We see that Jesus was a, when he came, it says in Mark chapter 1, that he proclaimed the, the message of the gospel, which was what? Repentance and belief in him. We see that Jesus challenged the religious, religious authorities and political authorities. So, good guess, Elijah. And then another, one, another disciple, not one to be outdone, we'll say John. Uh, he said, some say Elijah. Now, Elijah's a great guest as well. He's probably the most known and best known prophet in the Old Testament in the nation of Israel. And he was mainly doing miracles and wonders. We, we know that he prayed for like three and a half years uh, for a drought and it didn't rain. Then he prayed again and it rained. And that's in, in 1 Kings chapter um, 17. We also see that James mentions that. We also know that he, he um, raised um, uh, a widow's son from the dead. He defeated the 450 uh, prophets of Baal by calling fire from heaven. So he was a worker of miracles, and he did wonders. And again, good guess. Why? Because we see Jesus do the same thing. Uh, we see Jesus uh, raise Jairus' daughter from the death. We see Jesus healing people physically when they're blind. He, he gives them sight. Where they're lame, he makes them walk. We, we see has, Jesus has incredible 
power. So Elijah, another solid guess. And then others say, like, we'll say, who? Give me a disciple. Nathaniel, there we go. Or Andrew, I will say with Nathaniel. All right, Nathaniel. I thought, sure, you guys would say James, but Nathaniel, right? Some say, hey, he's just a prophet. We go to, to Matthew's account in verse 16. He, Matthew adds Jeremiah, Jeremiah or a prophet. Now, hey, again, another good answer, right? What was the role of the prophet? The role of the prophet was to proclaim, but notice he was just a prophet. They were saying he was just a prophet, not the prophet. So again, another good answer. So what, we, what do we see here? We see a good sample size of the culture around them saying good things about Jesus, acknowledging the actions of Jesus, and that's key. These individuals were acknowledging the actions of Jesus, which is good, but it's not the right answer. It doesn't give them a clear picture of who Jesus is. They were still wrong in their answers. They missed who Jesus really was. See, all these men, John the Baptist, Elijah, the prophets, Jeremiah, they were the forerunners to the Messiah, to the one coming that was going to set them free. They were the ones in their ministries pointed to Jesus. That was their function. That was what they came. And then when we get to Jesus, his life, his actions, his words, his preaching wasn't pointing to the future Messiah and the coming Messiah. They were pointing to him. He was saying he was the Messiah. So one commentator put it this way. So Jesus wasn't the pointer. He was the point. And if you miss Jesus, you miss the point. And that's why these people, this culture, got Jesus wrong. Because they were looking towards his actions and what he did, and they'd missed who he was. And today, for the most part, our culture focuses on the same thing about Jesus, don't they? You go around to the CSU campus or wherever, even in your workplace, and you ask the people, who, did, who, is, who do people say that Jesus is? What, do you, what does the culture say about Jesus here in Fort Collins, Colorado, or Greeley, or Windsor, or northern Colorado, or, or wherever you're from? Who do people say that I am? What is the culture saying? They focus on his actions. Let me highlight a number of them for you. Um, back in the 80s and the 90s, there was this movement called the Jesus Seminar. Uh, who's familiar with the Jesus Seminar? Probably us that are over, uh, you know, 35 and up, right? 80s, 90s. Um, but basically, the Jesus Seminar was a bunch of individuals, um, scholars, laymen, about 200 people, and, and they, they sought out to look and answer this question, who was Jesus? And they took the Bible, and what they did was is they, they decided on what things he said, And they had a point system. And if they said, yeah, Jesus said that, you get a red dot and you get three points. Uh, What Jesus might have said, then they gave him a pink bead. Now you got two points. And and then indicated they also voted on what believed that Jesus did not say. And they gave him a gray bead that was worth one point. And then they voted to and said, well, this is what Jesus said. And later, it wasn't Jesus, but his admirers who actually spoke on behalf of Jesus. So this point system. Because apparently, eyewitness accounts and testimonies was not good enough for these jokers, right? I mean, think about how crazy that is. Th- these people decided to say who Jesus was, and they discounted those that were there. And so this is what they came up with. Uh, Robert Funk said this, that Jesus was a witty teacher like Buddha or Socrates. Uh, J.D. Crossan said this, that Jesus was a wondering philosopher. Marcus Borg, another uh, guy at the Jesus Seminar, says that Jesus was a charismatic faith healer. And then we can go to the modern day like today, and these guys are still around, but uh, modern day Bart Ehrman, kind of a modern Jesus Seminar guy, said Jesus was a first century apocalyptic prophet who expected the end of the world come. And then you go around to some college campuses and you see that Jesus was a, is a feminist. And when you talk to some psychologists, they say that Christ is the therapist for all humanity. When you, you ask Mikhail Gorbachev if he was still alive, he would say that Jesus was the first socialist. Uh, you go to the world religions. Islam says he was a prophet a little bit lower than Muhammad. Uh, Mormons say that he was the, the, the brother of Lucifer or Satan. Jehovah's Witnesses say he was the archangel Michael. And then you come to pop, pop culture, um, or, uh, you know, Jesus uh, is my homie on, you know, on T-shirts. Uh, you, got, you got South Park Jesus, right? And then you got Ricky Bobby Jesus, right? Little sweet baby Jesus, right? You know? And so you got all the... Oh, it's confusion. There's no clarity on who Jesus is out in culture. They're just as confused as the culture in the disciples' day. 
So when you ask people, who is Jesus? No one really knows. They have opinions, but no one really knows. And what's interesting is that when these individuals or people you ask, you, you say, who is Jesus? They think they're actually honoring Jesus when they say that he was a good teacher. They think they're actually giving honor to Jesus when, he, when they say that he was a, you know, a, a good therapist. They actually think they're complimenting Jesus. When in fact, what they're doing is not complimenting Jesus, but it's the exact opposite. It, it's a slap in the face to Jesus. Why? Because they're not recognizing who Jesus really was. And so it's a slap in the face. It's not a compliment. And I believe, along with C.S. Lewis, I believe that C.S. Lewis was right when he said to culture and to you and me, he said, you have three options to believe about Jesus. Either he was what? A liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. Those are our three options. And the reason why he can come up with those three options and culture gives us a million different options. The reason why he can come up for three options is because we have God's revealed word. We have his revelation to give us a clear understanding on who Jesus is. So we can say that with C.S. Lewis. We have a clear revelation of who Jesus is, his word through scripture. And scripture clearly tells us who Jesus is. So that leads us to the second question. So let's go there real quick in verses 29 and 30. The second question is not as what, what does culture say? Not, as, not, not what they saying out there, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He asked the disciples directly, face to face. And think about, put yourself in the disciples' position. Put Jesus here. Now, Jesus is talking to you. He's asking you this question this morning. Who do you say that he is? It's a direct question. You see, in the midst of all what other people are saying out there in culture, um, what culture is saying about me, in the midst of other religions, of university professors, of, of co-workers, of students, of political leaders, of professionals, who do you say that I am? And that's the question, again, for all of us this morning as we walk out those doors. That's the question that you and I need to answer this morning. Because in reality, our lives and our eternity depends on Him. So be sure, as you walk through those doors, you answer this question. Peter steps up. Are we shocked by that, right? Peter steps up to, to be the, the spokesman for all the disciples. And I can, I, can, I can just picture in heaven that when Peter starts to speak and answer one of Jesus' questions, you got the angels are like, all right, boys, get out your popcorn. Peter's about to speak again, you know. This is going to be good. And uh, they're just waiting and Peter answers, you are the Christ. Amen. Matthew adds a little bit more detail. You are the Christ, the anointed one, the, the Savior, the Redeemer. You are the Christ, Matthew adds, the Son of the living God. That's who Jesus is. He's the Christ. He's the, he's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He is the Son of the living God. An amazing answer, isn't it? Why? Well, one, because it comes from Peter, right? Because usually when Peter opens his mouth, he doesn't get it right, does he? He usually says something foolish, and we'll see in a couple verses even later, he does say something foolish. He actually rebukes Jesus like verse 32 of uh, chapter 8, and, and, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And that's where the angels go. Here we go. Back Peter back to his normal self again. All right. But anyways, so he says that. But here's the reason why it's even more important. Because it's the first time the disciples truly get who Jesus is. You see, up until the, the gospel narratives, up to this point, there have only been a couple uh, individuals or, or God who, who know who Jesus is. God the Father knows who Jesus is. This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Remember that at the baptism. The demons know who Jesus is. When Jesus goes to, to cast them out, they're like, why, why have you come so soon, O Son of the living God? And then we have John the Baptist who kind of got who Jesus was. When, when he did come, he, he, they, he said correctly, behold the what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then later on, he sends his disciples to Jesus while John's in prison and say, hey, are you really him? Right? And then you even have Simeon at, Simeon at the gate when he, Jesus first goes to the temple to get dedicated. And he knows he is because there was a promise made to Simeon that he would not die before he seen the Savior. So that's it. Out of the three years and the hundreds, if not the thousands of people that Jesus has proclaimed who he turned to be, these are the only four 
that recognize who he is, and then, of course, the disciples. That's why it's so amazing. Because at this point, there is clarity on who Jesus is for his disciples. So the question is, well, what changed? What, what, what changed in Peter for him to answer correctly? And Matthew gives us insight. And what Matthew says, the grace of God penetrated Peter's heart. It was the grace of God. God the Father bestowing grace, the Spirit regenerating Peter's heart, opening their hearts and their eyes so they could respond correctly by faith. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17 says this, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Peter, for flesh and blood has not revealed this. In other words, you didn't come up with this on your own. It wasn't your intellectual genius. But my Father who is in heaven... That's who revealed it to you. That's who gave you the answer. So this morning, if you and I stand with Peter and confess that Jesus is the Christ when we answer that question, the reason why we can do that, the reason why we confess that, the reason why we believe that is not because we are some, have some intellectual capacity that others don't. It's not that we are the cat's meow. It's because of the grace of God. Because the grace of God bestowed his loving kindness and mercy on us. And he revealed himself to us. And that's a beautiful truth. Because if he didn't do that, if he didn't break in and reveal himself to us, we would still be blind. And when we ask the question, who is the Christ? We would say, oh, he's just a great teacher. He's a great servant. But we wouldn't recognize him for who he is. The Messiah, the Savior, the Christ, the Son of God. So that's a wonderful, wonderful truth. Now it goes on, it does give us a little bit. I have a question immediately. I goes like, well, how did, when Peter said that, I was like, man, how would, what was the look on Jesus' face when he did that, right? Now we don't have that in the text. In fact, we see immediately, it says in verse 30 that Jesus tells him not to tell anyone. You're like, wait a second, you got the answer right. And that reason came to, to show people that you are the Christ, but why not tell anyone? Because they feel, they, even though they got it, they didn't get it. They, they still thought of a, of a political rebellion that Jesus was going to lead, like the Exodus, kind of like Moses led the people out of the promised land of Egypt, under the oppression of Egypt. They thought that's what Jesus did. He was going to be this general that, that leads them out under Rome's oppression, and that wasn't quite it. You know, Jesus came to die for the sins of the many. And so Jesus tells us to keep him to himself until the plan unfolds. But for us today, we look back. And it's not, hey, don't tell anyone that you know that Jesus is the Christ. In fact, today, it's go and tell everyone. Make disciples of all nations. Tell everyone about Jesus. But going back to that, I mean, when when Peter said that, what what do you think that Jesus' face looked like? What was his response? I have to think that Jesus just had a big old grin on his face, right? That he was just like, yes, Peter, you got it. He was pumped because he got it right. Got it right. Who do you say that I am? Well, let's just touch base quickly on what can, what can we pull from this short little portion of Scripture? Well, first, I think I think we can observe and apply to our lives is that first uh, that that loving Jesus, being a Christian, is first and foremost about believing in who Jesus is, not what He has done. That's number one. Believe who Jesus is first and foremost, which then informs us of everything that He has done. You see, again, as we already pointed out, most answers about Jesus deal with what he did and not who he is. And people in culture, and maybe even some of you in here, you think, wow, if I just do and be like Jesus, he's going to be happy with me. In fact, I was searching on some websites and looking at different religious videos this past week to answer this question, who is Jesus? And I was on a, on a, on a, a Mormon site, I believe, and uh, the comment was this on who is Christ and, and how do you get to heaven. And the comment went something along like this. He says, if I just act and, and try to follow Jesus, and I try to love like Jesus, I try to serve like Jesus, I try to judge like Jesus, then, then he'll be happy with me. 
And you see, that's not what Jesus or Christianity is about. It's not about mirroring Jesus' actions, though that happens. It's not merely about how can I behave better like Jesus, then he'll be happy with me. It's about who is Jesus? Who is he? Christianity is about answering that question. And when you answer that question that Jesus is Christ, when you answer that question that he is the Lamb of God who was come to take away the sins of the world, when you answer the question that he was the one to, not to come to, to, to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, when you answer Jesus that way and you're clear on who he is, that he is the Son of God, then everything he does after that is now informed. And when we believe correctly who Jesus is, that will lead us to implications on how we live our lives. But first, we must get that question right. Who is Jesus? John said this in John 14 about Jesus, or Jesus said this, if you love me, then keep my commandments. See that principle right there? First, if you love me, not, not what I do for you. If, you. if you love me, that you know who I am. I'm the Christ. I'm the Messiah. If you love me, then that does something. That, and then, secondly, you will keep my commandments. You see, love for Jesus, for who he is, produces obedience. Obedience doesn't produce love for Jesus. And that's the difference between the gospel of grace and the gospel of works. And we want to be a gospel of grace church here. And so this morning, first and foremost, do you love and believe in Jesus for who he is. He is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. As revealed in Scripture, and not by the opinions of men and women of the culture. Second thing I think we can apply is when we experience the grace of God. When we experience the grace of God, God the Father, when we are regenerated and empowered by His Spirit, we will not be swayed by the culture. We will not be swayed by our co-workers. We will not be swayed by college professors. We will not be swayed by the talking heads on TV. But we will follow the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, namely Jesus. We are not swayed by popular opinions, not swayed by college professors, celebrities on the news, again, political parties or religious establishments. When we are rooted in the grace of God and His Word, the winds of culture looking to rewrite the identity of Jesus and the Christian faith will not sway us. But we will be standing firm on the rock and being beacons of light to a world that needs it so desperately. See, as a pastor and being in ministry for the past 20 plus years, one of the, the saddest things that, that I see is that when people get picked off by the enemy uh, because they start listening to the culture. They start listening to the college professors. They start listening to their friends. And they're swayed. John puts it like this in 1 John 3. They love the world more than they love Christ. They, 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 they pursue the desires of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride of life. And again, they love the world more than Jesus. Sometimes it happens to people in the church, doesn't it? We see people that were in the church, you're like, all of a sudden they're sitting next to me on Sunday. The next day, they want nothing to do with God or Jesus. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. But it's a constant chipping away the voices of the world the culture that is led by the prince of darkness. They're not, I think of it like this. It's the people that, if you've ever swam in the ocean, most of us have maybe taken a dip in the ocean. And if you don't have a fixed point on the beach when you're swimming, right, what happens is the next thing you know, you pick up your, your eyes and you're a mile down because the current just takes you away. You don't feel it, but you're just getting taken away. And that's the same with true with here. When, when ours, our eyes aren't fixed on the grace of God, when our eyes aren't fixed on the, the Word of God and constantly being meditated on these and pondering, as we learn in Psalm 77, we start to drift. And the enemy can pick us off. 
That's one of the, the saddest things to me as a, as, a, as a pastor of a church. And over the 20 years, I've seen that happen. Sad. But on the flip side, one of the greatest joys of being in ministry is watching people stand on that foundation that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And when culture and the professors and the co-workers, family members come and try to dissuade you other ways, people stand firm. And now usually a lot of times this happens in that, that college year age, you know, young professional age. Brandon and Jason are doing the college ministry here, talked about that um, something like, remind me, 80% of the people, Christians can walk away, is that right? Huh? 7 out of 10, 70 uh, that grow up in the church seem to fall away. Well, I was in college ministry, fellowship of Christian athletes, and, and I was just going through the individuals here at the crossing that, that, that just welled up joy in me. Why? Because of the truth of this statement, that those that build their lives on the rock, on Jesus, survive and live. And don't just make it through a little bit, but great joy. Not perfect, ups, downs, all arounds, times that they fall, but the characteristic of their life is there's joy, there's peace, there's hope, there's happiness. Think of Max and Elise Jackal. They came in as two young freshmen, right? Now they're married and just are pillars of the Christian community. Think of Daniel and Michelle Smith, same thing. Think of Carly and Leslie Peterson, now Carly Crop, Leslie Fawcett. I think of uh, Jason Smith. I think of uh, Paul Hewitt, the guy that I led to Christ my first year at the University of New Mexico on the baseball team, who's, who's led the last 20 plus years as a coach, ministering to, to kids and, and teaching them about Christ. I think of Jason Schutz. I think of Mark Town. I think of Kara Ziga Ziegen. I, I think of all these individuals that stood on the rock. And as, again, the culture came to try and shift them away from Christ, they stayed firm. In fact, they were the swayers. They were the influencers. Many of you know their influence, know their passion for Christ. And not only them, but we see that also, I started to remember, okay, what about other people in the body? How about Bernie? Where's Bernie? Miss Bernie over here. I said, Bernie. When did you come to know Jesus? I knew it was like a long time, right? Bernie says, well, it was when I was three, and I'm 91. And I was like, you know me, I picked my degree on the least math. And uh, I was like, oh, so 80 plus years, right? You know? <laughs> but Abby Chen was there, and she said 87. I'm like, oh, yeah, 87, exactly, right? 87 years. And she's still standing firm. She's not swayed. She's here almost every Sunday. Rain, shine, snow, sleet. She, she goes up and, and teaches your children about Jesus. Think of the Moors. Where are the Moors at? Where are they at? 50, 55 years of marriage. 55 years of marriage. We live in a world where, where you know, that's not the norm. So what's the secret sauce? Right? How can, how can they be married for 55 years? How could Bernie, you know, follow Jesus for 87 years? Because their lives are built on the rock. They answer that question correctly. Who do you say that I am? And they stand firm with Peter's confession. You are the Christ, son of the living God. That's what the secret sauce is. If you're in here and you want a life of joy, a life of purpose, a life of meaning, of hope and peace, then build your house on the rock who's Christ Jesus. Who do you say that he is? You see, this is why we are constantly here at the crossing talking about the importance of Sunday gatherings and being consistent with coming Sundays of life groups, of journey groups, and our other times of gather times and scatter times. They're, they're so vital 
to your health and my health as a Christian. Why? Is because here we get fed the word of God consistently. It's, it's in these places where we get to experience the grace of God consistently. You see, in my 20 plus years, one thing that I've seen over and over of my experience is that those who are inconsistent in these areas, Sunday gatherings, life groups, discipleship, other gather scatter nights, those that are consistent are usually not pillars in their own personal Bible study time. And what happens is they lose their focal point on the beach and they start to drift. And the next thing you know, their family's a wreck. Their lives are headed towards destruction. They look up and they say, help. And that's why I'm so pumped about Porterbrook. We've been racking our brains on, man, how can we bring a cohesive, what, what material? Do we need to write something? Do we need to go through something? But what can bring us back to getting our nose constantly in the grace of God and in the scriptures and with one another? And the Lord brought us back to Porterbrook. This is one of the most healthy seasons in our church. It's one of the most times where we exploded in growth because when you have, you know, hundreds of people walking and studying and learning, first and foremost with our individual relationships with Jesus, when our vertical relationship is right, then that informs our horizontal relationships with one another, with our spousal relationships, with our friendships, with our families, with our coworkers, with our fellow students. And we live for the glory and the grace of God. Our noses are in the grace of God and we're walking in the grace of God and not in works righteousness. Our identity is in what Christ has done for us and not in our own efforts and our own work and what we do. And it just permeates to the community. So we go to the Alpha Center and love on people that need Jesus. Uh, we, 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 we support ministries of life for the innocent to, to help people out of human trafficking. We're able to, to give grace and mercy and forgiveness and extend that to our spouses. Kids, you're allowed to, you can extend your forgiveness to your parents when they sin against you. You walk in the gospel. That's why I'm so pumped that we're going through Porter Brook because it's not just going to give us head knowledge, but it's going to give us practical ways to implement what we're learning in our lives about the grace of God through the word of God, empowered by the spirit of God, so that we become the swayers. We become the influencers in the classrooms, at the workplace, in all the circles of life. It'll help us walk in the grace of God and live out the confession that Jesus is the Christ. And so that's why I'm excited. And I can't think of a better way to start the, the new school year, the new season of life with this foundation. That as we walk out these doors, we know the answer to that question, who do you say that I am? And our question is a solid, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Let's pray.